So let's uh, kind of recap with what we were talking about uh, the other day with infective endocarditis. Um, some of the risk factors. So risk factors for endocarditis. This is going to be one of the biggest ones. It's going to be underlying heart defect. So if you have artificial heart valves, that's really huge. Right? So that's, it's a place where bacteria can easily adhere to. So that's one huge concern. Uh, that's one of the reasons why nowadays when dentists do a root, like a, a dental procedure, they're only really going to give you antibiotics if you have some sort of like uh, arrhythmia, so an abnormal heartbeat, or if you have uh, something like a prosthetic heart valve or a damaged heart valve, then they'll give you antibiotics for those types of routine dental procedures. Speaking of dentistry, poor dental health. If you have crappy teeth like this poor person over here, that's a huge risk factor for infective endocarditis because the bacteria that live in your mouths that cause cavities, those love to vegetate, uh, cause vegetations on heart valves. So streptococcus uh, mutans, strep mutans, that's the main one that causes dental caries and tooth decay. Those are really huge risk factors for infective endocarditis. IV drug use, of course, because you're sticking a needle in your uh, veins to pump yourself full of God knows what, heroin. Some people use uh, IV drug, uh, intravenous needles for cocaine sometimes. Sometimes they'll even do it for methamphetamines. Mostly it's going to be heroin, things like that, like opioids. But a uh, huge risk factor because you're not going to be swabbing it down with alcohol, right? If you're a drug addict, you know, you don't care about that. <laughs> you just want to get the drugs in you. And so they're going to use sometimes dirty needles. And on top of that, they're going to introduce bacteria that's found on your skin into, your, into their circulatory system. And so those are all going to be huge risk factors for infectious endocarditis. And then, of course, rheumatic fever. So post streptococcal rheumatic fever. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of these bacteria are found in your mouth. Uh, so strep, uh, viridin group strep, uh, those are going to be your strep mutans, also strep oralis, but strep mutans is the most common because that's the one that really causes tooth decay. Those are going to be found in your mouth. And then other things that can cause um, endocarditis. Staphylococcus epidermidis, or epidermidis, however you want to pronounce it. Epidermidis, it's found on your skin, right? So IV drug users, this is one of the ones that can get into your circulatory system. Staph aureus, also commonly found on your skin. Right? So those are things that are found in your skin. IV drug addicts are going to have these types of issues with those bacteria. Enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus faecalis is something that like all of us have in our GI tract. And if it escapes the GI tract and it gets into your blood and you get bacteremia from that, the biggest concern for enterococcus is that it causes endocarditis. So my wife, last year, she became septic from a GI issue. And last year, she uh, got enterococcus in her bloodstream. And so when that happened... First of all, she was on a pick line for 14 days, and thank God she recovered. Um, on top of just getting treated for antibiotics, they had cardiology come, and they were doing uh, cardiograms, right? So they did ultrasound, right? and then they were just measure, they were just trying to see if there was anything wrong with the valve leaflets, right? Because if, if God forbid, her valve leaflets got colonized with enterococcus, she's going to have to get valve replacement surgery as a consequence. So thank God that didn't happen. But that's one of the biggest concerns with enterococcus is that you can get endocarditis as a consequence. So um, for this is for uh, dentistry, right? Dentistry now uh, they avoid to avoid drug resistance. You want to avoid giving people bacteria uh, antibiotics for just like any sort of routine dental procedures. So hmm, unless the patient has something going on with their heart, they have an underlying heart issue, maybe an arrhythmia or damaged valve leaflet. And then I wanted to include this here because other things can cause uh, endocarditis too. It's not just bacteria. I already told you guys about the story about the patient that was spitting in her IV line, right? So this is how she died. She got candida. Candida, uh, you find that in your oral cavity. You also find it in like vaginal and anal mucosa. Um, but if candida gets into your blood, you can become septic. And candida can colonize your valve leaflets as well. So it can cause infectious endocarditis as well. Biggest concern with these things is septic emboli, right? When a, you get septic emboli that make its way to different parts of your body, 
The worst place would be the brain, so that would cause a septic embolus stroke. All right, that's not a good situation. Can you mean what does it do under normal circumstances? It's it's just part of your normal like uh, microbiota. So we have lots of bacteria that just live on us that are usually good, right? They actually help to like fend off really bad microbes. Have you taken microbiology yet? So you learned about the normal microbiota. Yeah, so the normal microflora is a good thing, right? So in your GI tract, you have tons of bacteria that's usually good. They help you break down nutrients. They help you absorb vitamins and things like that. So they're good, right? Candida also, to a certain extent, can be good, right? If you get candidiasis, that means now you have an overgrowth of fungus, right? So that's where you get yeast infections. And for uh, HIV AIDS patients, uh, one of the AIDS-defining illnesses is esophageal candidiasis. So if you see that in a patient with HIV, you can diagnose that patient now with AIDS. Right? So candida is normally on your body, not a big deal. Sometimes it can overgrow, especially if you have pH imbalance in the vaginal mucosa, so that can cause things like you know, uh, cause yeast infections. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty benign fungus, not a big deal. But you, it's like things have to be in the right place, right? Enterococcus faecalis, as, as I was mentioning with my wife. You usually find that in your GI tract. Totally fine. Once it gets out of the GI tract and into the blood, huge problem, right? So your normal microbiota is generally a good thing, but only if it's controlled and if, you're, if you find them in the right locations in the body. Um, dysbiosis, which you, you guys are familiar with C. diff diarrhea, right? So Clostridium difficile. We all have that in our GI tract. But with C. diff diarrhea, it's usually a consequence of antibiotic therapy. So the person takes broad spectrum antibiotics, wipes out all their good bacteria, and now Clostridium difficile can just run rampant, and it becomes an opportunistic infection. But it's, it's usually in your body, and it's not causing any issues if you have other bacteria there to like, you know, keep it under control. So a lot of these things you find in your body. Strep, strep uh, pneumo, strep pyogenes, sometimes you find those in your body and they're not causing any issues until they become opportunistic. Um, so septic emboli, when it comes to infectious endocarditis, that's the, one of the biggest things, right? So septic emboli causing stroke. You can see little splinter hemorrhages in your nail beds, so that'd be something you look for in a physical exam. You could see uh, septic emboli affecting capillary beds, for example, in this person's eye over here. So you can see that in all sorts of different parts of your body, septic emboli. And so here's a chart that kind of, don't bog yourself down with all this information, but just know that these are some of the things that you can see with infectious endocarditis. Cerebral emboli, stroke. Uh, you can see splinter hemorrhages. Um, if it's bad enough, long-standing endocarditis, where it's actually causing effect, uh, serious effects on cardiac output, things like that, you might see your, your nail beds getting affected uh, through enlargement. So you can see digital clubbing, um, if it's affecting your kidneys, you can see hematuria. You will see petechia around your skin, right? So lots of different signs and symptoms of endocarditis. Pathogenesis. A um, couple different ways that these can uh, affect the body. So biofilms. A biofilm is uh, the way that bacteria is able to adhere to surfaces and to protect themselves from the environment. So it's one of like the virulence factors of bacteria. They can form biofilms. Some of the ones that are most concerning are like Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas aeruginosa forms biofilms, particularly in indwelling catheters. So if you have a Foley catheter, you know that, or if you have you know pick lines, central lines, things like that, catheters in general are going to be uh, a risk factor for biofilm. So usually you can just remove the catheter, treat the patient with antibiotics, replace the catheter with something else, right? So you can usually be able to address that. But biofilms, uh, that's one of the ways that bacteria colonizes. It also helps them like aggregate, so more bacteria can accumulate to those areas, and then they can also kind of share their nutrients with each other in those like little tiny colonies. So that's a biofilm. Emboli, where you talked about that, so septic emboli, where you have a little chunk fly, um, flying off, and getting thrown into the circulatory system. And if it winds up in your brain, then you get a stroke. And then you can also see uh, um, aneurysms being a risk factor of that too. What's up? Yeah. 
Yes, yes. So if you have a vegetation on your, like, Madra valve, for example, or if a vegetation on your aorta, aortic valve, so if a little chunk flies off of that, that's a septic embolus. So you have the vegetation, and then you have, consequently, uh, a risk factor for emboli. So if it comes off of your mitral valve or your aorta, what are some of the first vessels off of your aorta? You have your brachiocephalic, you have your common carotid, right? Those are going to go up to your brain. So that's one of the biggest concerns is getting stroke, right? That's those are the first vessels that come off of the aorta. Um, if you have antibodies as a post-streptococcal infection, you can get post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. And so those antibodies begin to attack the glomerulus, and now you're going to see damage to the kidneys. And that's why you can see like hematuria as a consequence of infectious endocarditis. But this is going to be immunological mediated. So these are immune complexes, antibodies that your own body creates that are now starting to attack your own tissues. So here are the major you know, symptoms of endocarditis. Uh, you'll see Janeway's lesions, Osler's nodes. We talked about those before. Splinter hemorrhages. You can see rot spots in the eyes. And so uh, some things that you might see as well, positive echocardiogram, showing that there's colonization of those valve leaflets. A murmur, right? So if it's mitral valve, uh, if it's affecting the mitral valve, you might hear a murmur. If it's aortic valve, you also might hear a murmur. Um, if you take blood cultures and get positive for bacteria, that's going to be part of all the major... Uh, Duke's criteria. And then minor Duke's criteria, fever, immunological signs. So don't uh, bog yourself down with the Duke criteria. Just know just like the signs and symptoms of endocarditis and you should be good. So these are those other uh, those findings that you'd be able to see. You might see splinter, splinter hemorrhages. If you looked into the person's eyes, you might see rot spots at the retina. And then Osler's nodes, fingers and toes, and then Janesway lesions are going to be on the palms and soles. Hmm. Cool. What's up? Oh, uh, don't, okay, I was going to actually tell you guys, don't worry about subacute versus, like, yeah, don't worry about those distinctions. Just no endocarditis. <laughs> yeah, just no infectious endocarditis. I'm not going to parse out subacute versus acute and all that. Yeah, don't worry about that stuff. Those are just like uh, different subcategories of endocarditis. I'm not going to test you guys on that. Uh, all right, let's switch gears now. So we talked about the heart. Um, let's now talk about vessels. So vasculitis. Vasculitis is broad, right? So there's lots of different types of vasculitis. There's Kawasaki's disease. There's uh, Boerger's disease. There's Berger's disease, which is different than Boerger's disease, which is an IV, um, IgA nephropathy. Lots of different uh, vasculitises. So we're only going to cover a small handful of the ones that you're going to be responsible for. But if you have vasculitis, itis is inflammation, right? So vasculitis, inflammation of blood vessels. So you have thickening of the vessels, and they get narrowed, and then you can get high risk for ischemia. You're going to see that being a huge issue for Boerger's disease, Boerger's disease, where you have necrosis taking place because of how severe the ischemia is becomes like almost kind of like an infarct type of scenario. Then you also get a lot of thrombi, right? So you have increased re risk for thrombi because of blood clotting. <clears throat> so you can see this in arteries and veins. So to distinguish between those, you have arteritis, that's arteries. Phlebitis is going to be veins. Think about like phlebotomy, for example. You're taking blood from a vein. So phlebitis would be inflammation of those veins. And then angitis is going to be within the blood vessel. Um, what are the different uh, vessels that can get affected? Large, medium, or small? There's different subcategories of vasculitis that fall under each of those. They affect different size blood vessels. And then uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, you can get fevers, fatigue, headache, weight loss, uh, and it really just depends on which areas are affected. Right? Different areas are going to have different types of signs and symptoms. So um, if it's affecting the kidney, you might get glomerular nephritis. Uh, if it's affecting the GI tract, you might get blood in the stool. If it's affecting your skin, you can see like um, uh, purpura, for example. Uh, there's a couple that cause purpura on the skin. Uh, Hanak, um, HS uh, purpura is one of them. Hanak-Schnolin, 
German word, it's hard for me to pronounce, but that's one that can cause uh, purpura. IgA nephropathy would cause, you know, kidney uh, involvement. Um, you can see basically any part of your body being affected. Eyes are going to be affected, especially by giant cell arteritis. It's going to be like temporal vein, uh, temporal arteries are going to be associated with that. So depending on which part of the body, you'll see different effects. So these are the ones that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on Boisier's disease, um, arteries and veins, and then we're going to focus on giant cell arteritis. Hanok Schoenlein, we're not going to talk about, but one of my students the other day, he had this. This is usually something that affects children, but he had this. He was in the hospital for like a month and a half. The doctors had absolutely no idea what the hell was going on with him. And so he, uh, they did, <laughs> they thought he had uh, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome because he had like issues with his nerves and stuff. Uh, so they did two lumbar punctures on him. Uh, then they thought he had Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So they did um, biopsies of his GI tract. Uh, they did all sorts of tests on him. They had no idea what the hell was going on. And then uh, the nephrologist finally came on board. And the nephrologist actually had type 1 diabetes. So he's familiar with autoimmune disorders, just from personal experience. And he's like, this looks kind of autoimmune. And so they did the blood test. Uh, sorry, they did renal tests. And they found out that he had Hanox showing uh, purpura, which can also affect the kidneys. So they did a kidney biopsy on him. Five minutes later, they diagnosed him with anoxaline uh, purpura. So they treated him with corticosteroids. And thankfully, th thankfully this is one that uh, you can treat and it usually doesn't come back. Usually autoimmune disorders, you live with it for the rest of your life. But this one can kind of like, you know, sometimes you can treat it and it just goes away. Kawasaki disease that's going to affect the heart. Um, Takayatsu is the uh, uh, aorta. So all these are going to be different areas of the body, right? But these are the ones we're focusing on. Bueges disease and giant cell arteritis. Here's another uh, uh, schematic that shows you the size of the arteries or vessels and which ones are associated with which diseases. So large vessel, vessel vasculitis, so Takayatsu's uh, aorta. Um, what else are we going to cover here? I didn't put it on here. Kawasaki disease would be heart. The ones that we're covering are not on this list, which is okay. Ah, here we go. So here is uh, giant cell arteritis. So that's going to be the temporal artery. So you'll be able to see the temporal artery. It's going to be kind of bulging. And then you'll take a biopsy of that to be able to diagnose. But the rest of these, don't worry about. These are going to be beyond the scope of this class. But just know that there's a lot of different types of vasculitis. Bourgeois disease, uh, we're going to talk about in a little bit that can cause some severe necrosis and gangrene of your fingers and toes. So I already showed you a picture of a patient that had severe Boisier's disease. So we're just going to kind of go over the pathophysiology of that in a moment. So let's start with giant cell arteritis. So uh, it used to be called temporal arteritis because it affects the temporal arteries. Um, because it affects uh, the temporal arteries, it can also affect the ophthalmic arteries. This can cause blindness uh, over time. So that's one of the serious uh, side effects of giant cell arteritis. Usually in older patients, you'll get throbbing pain. Uh, you'll get visual changes, obviously, because it can affect, uh, you know, it can cause blindness. Um, you might get pain in the jaw as well and fatigue after chewing. And you might also hear a brewery too. So if you use the bell of your stethoscope, and you try to auscultate, you might be able to hear a, like a whooshing sound, like a brewy. Um, it could, <laughs> this is one thing that can happen. We're going to talk about in neurology all the different types of headaches, migraine, uh, migraine headaches, uh, tension headaches, things like that. So this can also be mistaken for a tension headache because when you have a tension headache, it feels like you're, you have a tight band, like, like a tight band around your head. So if you had your temporal arteries getting affected by temporal or giant cell arteritis, that can kind of look a little bit like a tension headache. But then the irreversible vision loss, obviously, is going to be one of the more severe consequences of this. So it's an inflammatory type of disease. So if you wanted to test for inflammation, a C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is going to be elevated. And then you biopsy. So you literally just take a little biopsy of the vessel. And then you send it off for patho to get uh, diagnosed. And then they'll see giant cells. And then that's when you do 
uh, get a definitive diagnosis. Because it's uh, immunological, sorry, because it's uh, inflammatory, uh, corticosteroids, you can give that uh, to the patient. Corticosteroids are going to be very common in any sort of inflammatory disease. So give corticosteroids for a period of time, anywhere between a year to two years, and then that should be able to address it. All right, now let's shift gears into Boisier's disease, also known as thromboangitis obliterans. This one's really nasty. I mean, look at this photograph. It's so sad. Like, this person basically lost all their fingers except for their thumbs, fingers and their toes. Um, so this is really unfortunate because you can get some severe necrosis as a consequence. But what is it in response to? It's going to be associated with smoking, so it's going to be nicotine. So it can be both uh, cigarettes or it could be vapes that contain nicotine. So this is a response to nicotine products. Um, it's going to be in younger individuals, so 20 to 40, more females than males. It's going to be something that you see more in like the Middle Eastern type populations and demographics. Middle Eastern, East Asian, Indian. You don't see it in African Americans as much. And it's going to be autoimmune inflammatory process and tobacco or nicotine exposure. Um, because it's going to involve vasculitis and inflammation of the vessels, you get more thrombi uh, as a risk. Uh, you get an increased risk of thrombi and uh, hypoxic cell injury, which would result in dry gangrene. And so you would have to amputate those tissues that are affected. Those are not going to be coming back to life, unfortunately. All right, signs and symptoms. You're going to see it in your fingers and your toes. Those are going to be the major areas affected. Um, you can see gradations of severity. So you might first start seeing whitening of those tissues, right? So that's going to be ischemia, right? So you have reduced blood flow. Uh, they might eventually become a little cyanotic and turn blue. Uh, they might also become a little bit red when blood doesn't come back to those tissues. But if the blood does not come back to the tissues, then you're going to get necrosis of those uh, affected tissues. And this is going to be dry gangrene. Claudications is going to be uh, the term for the symptoms of reduced blood flow and ischemia. So clauditations are going to be really painful uh, muscles in the areas affected. So if a person has long-term claudications in their lower extremities, sometimes to increase the blood there, sometimes they'll even, you can actually ask the patients who have this, uh, how they sleep at night. Sometimes they'll actually sleep with their bed, over, their, their legs hanging over the bed so that more blood can get to those tissues. And so that's one thing you might be able to elicit in an exam when you, when you are asking them about their, the history of their present illness. So that would be claudications. So if you've got claudications in your hands and fingers, that would be due to decreased blood flow. Um, you can ask if the person's a smoker. Usually that's going to be the case for this uh, condition. And then if you do an angiogram, you're going to see corkscrew vessels. Treatment, tell them to knock it off with smoking. Um, you can exercise more, so you can get more blood flow. Um, and then you can take drugs like silostazole to uh, decrease vasospasms. But let's see the corkscrew uh, on angiogram. So here's normal. So all those vessels look really nice. They look mostly straight. And then these are the corkscrew vessels. You can see them all throughout the distal uh, fingers, right? So you got your thumb and all your other digits too. All right, so any questions on giant cell arteritis or Boerger's disease? Cool. So Raynaud's disease. So Raynaud's disease is a little bit different. You do get uh, redu reduction in blood flow to your fingers. So it kind of does look a little bit like Boerger's disease, right? You get similar types of symptoms uh, when it's less severe. Um, Raynaud's disease is mostly going to be unknown, so it's idiopathic. No one really knows exactly why. So that's primary Raynaud's disease. Secondary Raynaud's disease um, is going to involve other, uh, other uh, there's going to be other symptoms involved in that as well. So um, secondary Raynaud's disease is going to be secondary to something else, right? So you know kind of what the underlying cause is. Primary, you don't know. It's idiopathic. Secondary, you know what might be going on. So lupus is a really common autoimmune disorder that can cause Raynaud's disease. Scleroderma can cause Raynaud's disease. Sjogren's can cause Raynaud's. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can cause Raynaud's. So there's a lot of autoimmune diseases that can cause uh, Raynaud's disease. 
Drugs can also do it, so certain amphetamines, cancer drugs, beta blockers can do it. Um, if a person has arthrosclerosis, they're going to have poor circulation, so they're going to be predisposed to Raynaud's. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Typing, right? So if you type a lot, or if you play the piano, or if you're using tools a lot, you might get Raynaud's as a consequence of that. So these would, these would be secondary Raynaud's versus primary idiopathic. And so what's the progression? You have vasospasms causing reduced blood flow. When uh, you have deoxygenation, you become cyanotic, so those fingers are going to turn blue. And then when blood comes back to those tissues, you're going to see a reperfusion, so it's going to turn uh, red. Hmm. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, peripheral vascular disease and peripheral artery disease. Any questions so far? What's up? Uh, primary is idiopathic, we don't know. Secondary, secondary Raynaud's is going to be due to an underlying issue. Sometimes it's like, yeah, yeah. Raynaud's, Raynaud's disease is when you have painful claudications in your hands due to vasospasms. Okay? So I had that happen to me once when I jumped into cold water. When you jump into cold water, uh, your ve vessels constrict. You get vasoconstriction to prevent heat loss. And so if your vessels constrict in your hands, preventing heat loss, but also you're preventing blood flow, and it really hurts. And so when it happened to me, my hands were like really painful. So that was kind of like a Raynaud's phenomenon as a re reaction to vasoconstriction. But if you have like an underlying health condition like lupus or SLE, um, Sjogren's disease, those types of autoimmune disorders can cause secondary Raynaud's disease. What's up? Uh, that's a good question. because. <laughs> It's kind of like angina. It's ischemia of the heart, right? Raynaud's is ischemia of the hands. So it makes it more like specific. So it's like specific to a certain region in the body. But that's a really good question. It, th it theoretically is ischemia. Yeah, right? It just makes it, yeah, it's like ischemia is the umbrella term. Raynaud's would be the umbrella term for the hands. Uh, angina would be the umbrella term for the heart. So it really depends on which uh, area of the body you're, you're looking at. So it's more specific. That's a good question, though. We just like to make things more confusing than they have to be. <laughs> peripheral vascular disease, peripheral artery disease. So we kind of already talked a bit about arthrosclerosis already, but this is effectively what we're looking at, right? This is arthrosclerosis is going to cause peripheral vascular disease and peripheral artery disease. Older people... You'll see it also with vasospasms, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, hypertension, arthrosclerosis. All, all those are the things that are going to cause peripheral vascular disease, or PAD. Um, it can be asymptomatic, right? Because remember, uh, even with the heart, the coronary arteries, once it gets to about 50% occlusion, that's when you might start noticing things, right? You might notice it on exertion when you're like exercising or going up like a flight of stairs. So you can have some severe narrowing of the arteries, but usually you know, it can go uh, unnoticed, so it can be asymptomatic. Claudications, again, that same term, right? So you got really, really uh, painful muscles. You can see this in the lower extremities, especially during walking. For a patient with peripheral vascular disease, again, you can ask them, how do they sleep at night? Do they sleep with their legs dangling off the bed? That might be an indicator that they have peripheral vascular disease. If you were to try to palpate a pulse on these patients uh, peripherally, like the dorsalis pedis pulse or the uh, or tibial pulse, those are going to be very weak. So dorsalis pedis, it's going to sit uh, between the first and second metatarsal of your foot. And if you were to palpate that on a normal person with good vasculature, you're going to be able to feel that pulse. But if you have a diabetic patient because of peripheral vascular disease with diabetes, if you were to try to touch that pulse and palpate it, you probably wouldn't be existent. You wouldn't even feel it. So that would be an indicator that the person has peripheral vascular disease. Oh, yeah, definitely. Diabetic foot ulcers are going to be a combination of things. It's due to peripheral vascular disease, and it's also due to peripheral neuropathy. So what happens when you have peripheral neuropathy? You get numbness, sometimes pain and tingling as well, but numbness is the biggest concern. So the diabetic is walking along, maybe like, step on something, 
they get a little cut. What happens to that cut? They don't notice it because they don't feel the pain. Then uh, because of the peripheral vascular disease, you're not going to get white blood cells to that area. So you're not going to get tissue repair at that area. Then that is going to increase uh, risk for infection. You're not going to get circulatory perfusion to that area. So you're not going to get white blood cells there either. So you're not going to be able to fend off bacteria. And then that's how you get a diabetic foot ulcer. Then if you don't treat that, it turns into osteomyelitis. And then that's when you have to amputate right, the affected tissues. And so there's a lot of things going on with diabetes. It's not just the uh, vasculature. It's also the uh, neuronal component to that as well. Brewies. Um, whenever you disrupt laminar flow, or laminar flow, rather, uh, when you disrupt laminar flow, you're going to get a brewie, right? So if you had a patient with arthroscarotic plaques in their carotids, use the bell of your stethoscope, listen to it, you could hear a <laughs> type of sound. If you listen to the aorta and they have any sort of issue with the aorta, you can potentially hear a brewery there. Renal artery, when you're listening to the abdomen, you want to listen to the renal arteries. Sometimes if you have uh, any sort of like kidney damage or renal artery disease, uh, then you can see a brew, or you can hear a brewery on auscultation on the abdominal, abdominal exam. And then ulcerations. We just talked about that with, like, for example, diabetics. My grandma, uh, when she was alive, she had really bad uh, congestive heart failure, right-sided, and so she had petting edema on uh, both sides, and then she, for the longest time, it was years, she had an ulcer on her foot that was about this big. It was about, let's say, three centimeters wide, and she would always have to go get it treated um, with uh, wound care. They would constantly have to, like, replace the bandages and whatnot. It, like, it healed once, and then it came back again, but it was really hard to heal because it was poor vasculature to that area, so she had peripheral vascular disease, and so it causes ulcerations. Testing. Um, all sorts of tests you can do. If it's diabetes, you can check their glucose levels. Uh, hyperlipidemia, you can check their lipid panel, CBC, uh, and then you can do angiogram. Doppler uh, ultrasound is going to help determine the blood flow, and then you can also do ankle brachial index. And so let's do, let's watch a little video here. With the patient lying supine, apply the cuff or cuffs to the limbs, starting with the brachial artery in the right arm. Hold the Doppler pen as though it is a real pen. The strongest signal is at an angle 45 degrees to the artery, pointing toward the heart. Use this technique. Find the right radial artery at the thumb side of the inner wrist. Balance your wrist or ring and pinky fingers on the patient's arm or bed to keep the pen in hand. Pump up the cuff 20 millimeters of mercury about when you hear the last arterial beat from the Doppler. Slowly release the pressure from the cuff and record the pressure at which the first arterial beat returns, which is the systolic pressure. Remember, only the systolic pressure is obtained for APIs. Allow three beats before knowing the sound is not artifact. Write down the right radial pressure. Obtain the left brachial pressure using the Doppler the same way as the right arm and write it down. The higher of these is the denominator for the API equation. Next, apply the cuff to the right ankle just above the bone. Find the dorsalis pedis artery, PPA, by sliding the Doppler from inner to outer ankle across the anterior ankle. It will cross the PPA. Adjust the Doppler pen angle to 45 degrees to the skin and listen for how many peaks and fits you hear. This is your first clue as to presence of disease. Obtain the ankle pressure with the Doppler pen on the GPA. Write these pressures down. Obtaining this pressure is similar to the brachial pressure, only the systolic portion is recorded. If you have trouble finding the DPA at the anterior ankle, start between the great and second toe and slide proximately in between the bones to find the pedal arch. To find the right posterior tibial artery, PTA, start just behind the medial malleolus, or inner ankle bone, and slide posteriorly toward the Achilles tendon. You will cross the PTA. Use enough gel to get good contact with the skin. Listen for the waveform and obtain the pressure. Remember, the higher systolic number is used regardless if it is the PTA or the PTA. 
This number will be the numerator for the API equation. Repeat the exact steps to obtain blood pressure and listen to the Doppler for the left angle. In the interest of ergonomics, try using your left hand to hold the Doppler when obtaining the left PTA data. The higher the left PTA and PTA pressures is the numerator for the left API equation. So I hope you like this video. So I'm not going to ask you how to do all those calculations, but just know this. So if normal, equivalent to 1, right? because it's a ratio, right? So if it's like 1 to 1, that's going to be equivalent to 1. If the ratio is reduced, however, if the blood pressure in the arms and upper extremity is greater than the blood pressure uh, below, then you start seeing peripheral vascular disease. And so if your ABI or ankle brachial index is below 0.9, then you could diagnose the person with peripheral vascular disease. How do you treat this? You can do aerobic exercises, right? So you increase blood flow, stretching. Um, if the person's diabetic, make sure that they control their uh, hyperglycemia. Hypertension, reduce hypertension. If it's uh, cholesterol, you can try to have them modify their cholesterol. You can either have them take statins, or you can just have them do lifestyle modification. Tell them to stop smoking. Um, you can give them anticoagulants or blood thinners to help reduce stasis and, re and increase flow. Or surgery. You can actually do stents in these patients too. So you can actually put in a balloon stent, open it up, and that you increase your uh, blood flow in those areas. Uh, primary care can do an ABI. Yeah. So if you're primary care, internal medicine, yeah, you don't have to be a cardiologist. You do want to send these patients. You want to have this patient on a cardiologist, right? You want to have them have a cardiologist. Um, if it's bad, they might have a vascular surgeon involved as well to do, like, stenting and things like that. So there's a lot of people that can be involved in the care for this patient. Um, endocrinologist for diabetes, right? So there's lots of different people that would be involved in the management of these kinds of complex patients. These are older. These are generally going to be older patients, too. And generally speaking, the older we get, the more doctors we usually start seeing, the more drugs we have to take, right? So it's getting old is fun, huh? So this is like, this could have been a photograph of my grandma's leg. It's crazy. My, uh, the last time, because my grandma was living in Brazil, that's where she's from. My mom, she was out there helping her, and she would send me pictures like that. She would email me photographs of my grandma's leg, and it looked just like that. And actually... This little area right here, that was probably an ulcer that was opened up that just healed up over time. So my grandma, like her ulcer, looked when it healed, it kind of looked like that, but then it opened right back up again. That's pitting edema, right? So that means they put their little thumb in there, and to see the severity of the edema, you can see how long it lasts, how long it stays imprinted. So if it's like over two minutes, that's like stage four pitting edema. So it's really uh, it's different degrees of pitting edema. What's up? Um, cellulitis is going to be bacterial. This is due to stasis of blood. Cellulitis is going to be infection, and that's going to be involving uh, deep tissues, so like uh, dermis as well as your cutaneous layers of tissues. It could be cellulitis or it could be peripheral vascular disease. If you see this crusty, these little crusty lesions on there, that's, that's going to be mostly because of peripheral vascular disease. If it's not crusty, <laughs> for lack of better words, <laughs> and if it's just like red and inflamed and hurts really bad, cellulitis really hurts, that's going to be infectious. No, not really. Because when if you have cellulitis and you treat it with antibiotics, it's kind of like an acute thing. If you don't treat it, the person could become septic and die. So, <laughs> versus this, this is long term. This is something that people live with for years and years and years. This is like chronic illness, right? What's up? It's a it's a symptom of both. It can be a symptom of CHF and it could be a symptom of peripheral vascular disease, right? Because if you have peripheral vascular disease, you're not going to have good blood flow. So, what happens to the fluids? They they kind of linger in those tissues. Right? They get stuck into the interstitial space. You're not getting good flow. Oftentimes, these patients are not really moving a lot. My, you know, like, so a lot of times, you'll see a patient that's bedridden. Right? When they're older and they're not doing too well in their health, 
And so you see a lot of stasis. Because how does, how does blood move from your venous system? Mostly through muscle contractions. Right? And so if a person is not really active and they're not out there exercising or whatever, you'll start seeing blood pooling in places where they don't belong. Um, and pitting edema, of course, you see that in right-sided heart failure, too. And then, of course, there's the great, um, gradations of severity of pitting edema. It's like one to four. One being not so serious, doesn't last as long. Like you press it down, and it eventually comes back to normal. Four, you press it down, and your fingerprint stays there for minutes. And then ulcerations, right? Ulcerations, poor wound healing. Those are all symptoms of peripheral vascular disease. This is what you would see on an angiogram. So here's normal. And then this would be an abnormal angiogram. I'm trying to find exactly where the point is. Looks like over here you're having stasis. So this might be the areas that are affected. Here, that's where you have uh, the, the poor vasculature. Right? So you'd have to, you might want to put in a, a little balloon stent in there to open up that vessel. And then here's a stenosis. Here's before and after. Right? So here's before stent, after stent. So now you opened up that vessel and you can allow for proper blood flow. All right, any questions on peripheral vascular disease, peripheral artery disease? All right, let's talk a little bit of th about thrombophlebitis. So thrombophlebitis involves clotting. So you have a clot that's inside your uh, blood vessel, and phlebitis is going to be involving inflammation. And so inflammation of the vein could be due to a blood clot, right? So if it's non-bacterial, that could cause inflammation, just the fact that the blood is clotting, right? So d deep vein thrombosis, right? You're going to get inflammation from that. The blood is going to be pooling there in the leg. Um, and if you wanted to test for DVT, you just look at their leg. Usually it's going to be unilateral. It's going to be one side. Uh, it's going to be red. It's going to be swelling. It's going to be hot to the touch. And the pain is, uh, sorry, the patient is going to complain of pain in that extremity. So that would be uh, non bacterial, as an example. But if it's bacterial, that could be uh, septic or superative. And uh, that's going to be seen in like superficial type veins. So if you see a blood clot superficially involving bacteria, that's going to be a septic type of thrombophlebitis. Virchow's triad. This is going to be something that's good for you to be familiar with in terms of risk factors. So let's just look at Virchow's triad here. If you have altered blood flow, if you have damage to the endothelium, and if you also have hypercoagulability, those are all going to be pre, uh, predispositions for thrombophlebitis. Okay, so that's Virchow's triad. So if you're immobile, if you're bedridden, that's one thing that can increase your risk. If you have hypercoagulability for whatever reason, then that's going to increase your risk. Uh, varicosities, because think about varicosities. What's a varicosity due to? You guys remember from AMP? What are the things you find within veins that help to push blood in one direction? Valves. If you get damage to those valves and they like prolapse for whatever reason, blood is going to start pooling into those vessels. Those vessels get huge, right? So that's a varicose vein. Um, that is an increased risk for thrombi, right? So you're going to see increased risk for clotting in those vessels because the blood's not moving fast enough. Um, smoking, especially if you're uh, on birth control, that would increase your coagulability. It's a huge risk for DVTs, as an example. Um, high estrogen states. So pregnant women, it's kind of it's kind of sucks for pregnant women because they have an increased risk of lots of things: gestational diabetes. They have an increased risk also for uh, uh, varicose veins. So they're also going to have an increased risk for coagulability too. Um, hormone replacement therapy is going to increase your risk for uh, thrombophlebitis. Over the counter. Uh, contraceptives, or sorry, uh, combined contraceptives. So, and then cancer. Cancer is going to make you hypercoagulable. You're going to have a higher risk for coagulation when you have cancer. So, Virchow's triad, be familiar with that. So, altered blood flow, hypercoagulability, and um, endothelial damage. Those are all going to be risk factors. Signs and symptoms, sometimes it might not be symptomatic, but if it is, you're going to see swelling, redness, pain, heat. Um, you're going to see maybe emboli because thrombus, right? You might see a little chunk getting thrown off, and you might see an, a, thr uh, 
a thromboembolus reaching other parts of the body. It could reach the brain, could reach the, could reach the heart. And generally, you're going to see the lower extremities being affected. Lots of times when it comes to circulatory disease, it's going to be your lower extremities. right? Just because blood tends to pull down by your feet right? and it's furthest away from your heart. You can test it using a Doppler ultrasound so you can see how much blood flow is going through. And then D-dimer. D-dimer is that lab again where you can see fibrin mesh products being broken down. So you'll see D-dimer in all sorts of things, pulmonary embolism, DVTs, um, stroke, MI, disseminated intravascular coagulation. You can also see it in thrombophlebitis as well. This is what th thrombophlebitis can look like. It's, that's a really severe case. Um, you can see here the great saphenous vein is affected in this patient. And so the whole, all the areas around there are looking really dusky. You're getting like blood pooling in there. You're not getting good circula circulation in those regions. Any questions on thrombophlebitis? Let's really very briefly talk about Lemieux syndrome. Uh, very rare, but it's a septic, so it involves a bacteria. This is the bacteria, uh, Fusobacterium necroforum, and it's going to be in the oropharynx, but it can also be caused by Staph aureus, and this is going to affect your internal jugular vein. And it's very rare, so <laughs> yeah, let's move on. So let's talk now about shock. So, switching gears. Any question on any of the issues involving the vessels? So, no, your giant cell arteritis, no Boisier's disease, no thrombophlebitis. Okay, those are all going to show up on your next exam. Now, let's talk about shock. Hmm. Shock is where you have your blood pressure tanking. Really, really low blood pressure. And if you have low blood pressure, that means you're not getting proper delivery of oxygen to some of your vital tissues, right? So if you get shock, you can see renal damage because you're not perfusing the kidneys. You can see stroke because you're not getting enough blood to the brain, right? So those are some of the more severe types of consequences. So if you reduce cardiac output and it doesn't meet metabolic needs, that's, that falls under the category of shock. Um, hypotension, low blood pressure. Uh, what's going to happen as a consequence, this is your heart trying to compensate, your heart's going to start being really fast because if you have low blood pressure, you're not getting enough oxygen delivered to your vital organs, your heart's going to try really hard to compensate. It's going to start beating much faster so you can try to deliver blood to the rest of your tissues. You're going to get lactic acidosis as a consequence because of anaerobic metabolism. If you have hypoxia on your skin, you're going to feel cold and clammy. You're going to look pale. You're going to have decreased urine output because if you have damage to your kidneys, you're not going to be peeing much. So you're going to have a reduction in urine uh, production. And then you might get ultramental status if it's affecting the brain. You might get ultramental status. You might become confused. You might go into coma. And you might die as a consequence. These are the four major types of shock that we're going to be covering. Hypovolemic shock. So uh, if a person is dehydrated, for example... Anaphylactic shock, if they uh, have an allergic reaction that's severe enough. Cardiogenic shock, if their heart basically stops operating properly, then you're going to get cardiogenic shock. And then septic shock, which is going to be due to a bacterial infection. So hypovolemic shock, that's where you lose a lot of fluids. So reduction in blood volume uh, could be due to dehydration. could also be due to trauma. And burns. When you burn and you like your skin is damaged, you're going to start losing a lot of fluids. You're going to get fluid shift. So burns are really, you know, that's one of the main reasons how uh, why burns will kill somebody. So if you get over, I think it's over 60% burns in your body, you're high risk for this. Usually that's how the person dies. And then, of course, you get infections and things like that just from the exposed uh, compromised tissues. Um, low blood volume, you're going to get low cardiac output, and then you're going to get hypox a hypoxia from that. Cardiogenic shock involves the heart. If the heart stops pumping properly, maybe because you have heart failure, maybe you have a cardiomyopathy, like dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, you're not going to get enough blood getting pumped out of the heart. Anaphylaxis is going to be involving histamine. 
So if you have anaphylactic shock, you get a histamine release. What does histamine do? It increases vascular permeability, right? That's one of the main things. So you're going to see dilation of vessels. When you have mass dilation of vessels, your blood pressure goes down, right? And so if you get massive vasodilation throughout the body, you're going to get reduced cardiac output as a consequence. And so uh, reduced cardiac output, increased permeability as well. You're going to see edema in those areas affected. So like if a person has anaphylaxis, the biggest concern is like the respiratory system, right? They're going to see, you're going to see edema in the lungs, and you're also going to see angioedema in the mouth, in the oral cavity, like you're going to see edema of the uh, larynx. So that's going to make the person, uh, it's going to make it difficult for them to breathe. Uh, but then the other thing that's going to, you're going to see is the uh, cardiovascular component too. So that's why, that's why anaphylaxis is so scary. That's why you want to make sure that, that a person who has any sort of allergies to like bees or whatever, like uh, some you know, bee stings, you want to make sure that they have an EpiPen. Right? So an EpiPen can help to reverse this. What's up? Yeah, it's going to be immunological. Uh, so like bug bites, like bee stings, uh, food allergies, peanuts, um, things like that. It's usually going to be immunological mediated. So immunological, why? Because in, when you're talking about the immune system, you're talking about antigens, right? And so if you have a lot of antibodies against a specific antigen, then sometimes that's a good thing, right? Because you want to have antibodies against antigens. That's, that's how you get immunity. That's the whole purpose of like vaccines, for example. Or if you get natural immunity, you get a, an illness of some sort, and then now you have antibodies against that. That's great. But you can also see hyper uh, sensitivity. Right, so you have way too many antibodies, you get this massive reaction. And then you'll see mast cell involvement, you'll see basophil, basophils being involved, histamine release, and then the histamine is really what mediates all the, like the vasodilation and all that. So, yeah, it's going to be immunologically mediated. You can also get this from drug allergies. This is so sad. We had a, there was a kid when I was doing my clinicals, I did a little bit of a volunteering and clinical work at the main hospital in Dominica where I was in med school, there was a kid that just went in for a routine surgery. The kid was allergic to lidocaine, and he went to anaphylactic shock and died. So you can see allergic reactions to basically anything. You can develop an allergic reaction to anything in your life. So like my dad, he developed allergies to ant bites when he was in his late 80s. <laughs> and so like he had to start carrying around a pen, an uh, EpiPen with him. So, yeah, you can develop allergies against almost anything throughout your life. But, and they're very scary, right? Anaphylaxis will kill you if you don't treat it. Septic shock, that's going to be due to bacteria, and it's bacterial toxins. So bacteria can release different types of toxins. Uh, think about, like, toxic shock syndrome. That's going to be toxins that are specifically released by certain types of... Uh, it's mostly going to be uh, staph, staph aureus, but it can also be streptococcus pyogenes that can cause toxic shock syndrome. But these are going to be mediated by endotoxins, uh, sorry, exotoxins that are released by the bacteria. They cause inflammatory uh, response, and the inflammatory response causes vasodilation, very similar to histamine, decreased cardiac output, and then you get all the signs and symptoms of shock, right? Your blood pressure tanks, heart rate goes up, etc. So that's septic shock. That's why sepsis is so scary. Right? Because sepsis can cause septic shock if left untreated. So here's what's going on with sepsis. You got your bacterial infection. The bacterial infection is uh, going to be triggering an immunological reaction. The immunological reaction causes leaky vessels. Um, you could also see clotting, right? If you get like disseminated intravascular coagulation as a consequence. So sepsis is very scary. What's up? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. But the easiest way to think about it is bacteria. Right? If it's septic, it's going to be an infection. Right? Versus anaphylactic, it's going to involve usually like something that's causing a hyperallergic reaction, hypersensitivity reaction. Compensated shock. So um, you're going to see baroreflex, uh, baroreceptor reflex um, coming into play. So if you have low blood pressure, that's when you get the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system 
getting uh, activated. So what's the first steps of uh, the RAS system? So you have reduction in uh, blood pressure. So what's produced by the liver? Angiotensinogen. Then what's produced by the kidneys? Renin, good. Renin converts angi angiotensinogen into what? Angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 makes its way to the lungs. And then what does it come in contact with? ACE. So angiotensin converting enzyme turns into angiotensin 2. And then now you get vasoconstriction from angiotensin 2. It's a powerful vasoconstrictor. You also get aldosterone being released. Right? Aldosterone reabsorbs sodium. Water follows solutes. That helps to increase your blood volume. And so you get that like, whole entire system getting activated with reduced blood volume. Um, you can also see heart rate being increased, right? So you can try to increase your cardiac output. You can also see vasoconstriction, of course. Angiotensin uh, 2 is going to be involved in that. Um, if it's decompensated, hmm, this is a positive feedback loop. So uh, <laughs> decompensation, you're going to get reduction in cardiac output. The heart starts to die. And then you get further reduction in cardiac output. And that patient is basically on their way to the grave at that point. So you get reduced circulation, you get blood clots, you get even slower circulation. Um, the brain stem starts to get affected. Uh, you might start seeing reduction in cardiac output just because of the brain stem involvement, uh, ischemia, death, right? So that's going to be uncompensated shock. All right, any questions? All right, let's go into quizzes part three, and then we'll get through this, and then... Do neuro. I did make a lot of questions, though. So I made a lot of questions on this. I'm thinking that we can stop after. Let me see. Which question do I want to go until? So let me go ahead and let you guys sign in. Because I don't want to do all 20 questions. I do want to get into uh, neuro today. So we're going to do five questions of these 20. Earmark this so that you can go back to it later when you're studying. So you're going to do the remaining 15 questions on your own time. What's up? On this, this series? No, most of them are going to be one. Oh, really? What? <laughs> well, good. That's good to know. I'm like, I don't want you guys paying to have access to that. So, yeah, you should be able to, yeah, okay. Let me know if you have any problems accessing it. Or talk to your classmates. Obviously, they know what they're doing. All right, good. Most of you guys got that right. So rheumatic fever. Um, none of these others uh, are going to uh, coincide with her HPI. So the history of present illness. So you have this lady. Um, she's had this now, these symptoms for about three months. Shortness of breath, palpitations, chest pain. 
She's getting tired. She's noticing swelling. Uh, she has no significant metal hi medical history, no drug allergies. But she uh, is a school teacher. And as a school teacher, you're going to be exposed to a lot of bugs, right? Because kids are basically walking petri dishes. And so she got exposed to streptococcus, throat infection. So she probably got strep pyogenes, that's strep throat. And as a consequence, it affected her heart now. So what's that? When, it, when, it, when you have post-streptococcal infection causing damage to the heart, it's going to be rheumatic fever. Right? And so now she, you can see all the stuff that's happening. She has a, uh, a blowing holosystolic murmur. So it might be involving, uh, where is that? What is it? Her death at the apex. So it's going to be involving the mitral valve for this patient. So it sounds to me like she has a mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Yeah, never, it's actually in the vignette. Mitral valve regurgitation. And she also has edema in her extremity. So that's rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic fever. Are we good on that? So whenever you hear worst headache of your life, and then also puking, nausea and vomiting, uh, I really want you to think about a subarachnoid type hemorrhage due to a ruptured berry aneurysm. That's going to be one of the big things to keep, keep, out, uh, keep a lookout for. Um, this would not be consistent with an ischemic stroke, because what exactly is an ischemic stroke? There's two major types of strokes. There's ischemic stroke and there's a hemorrhagic stroke. We're going to talk about that when we get into neuro. What's the difference between those two? What's ischemia? Yeah, so ischemia is lack of oxygen because you have a blocked vessel. In this case, if it was ischemic stroke, you would have a blocked vessel and you wouldn't get blood downstream from that vessel. And so that would be an ischemic stroke. If the, rupture, if the vessel ruptured and started bleeding out, that would be a hemorrhagic stroke. It means blood now would start leaking out throughout the brain. That's not a good thing either. But this, does, this is not consistent with an ischemic stroke, um, especially when you look at the lumbar puncture. When you saw the lumbar puncture down here, uh, lumbar puncture showed blood within the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, So if you see blood in the cerebral spinal fluid, you're going to think that there's blood floating around in the brain as well. And because of the headache and nausea and vomiting, you're thinking a ruptured subarachnoid, uh, sorry, a ruptured berry aneurysm, subarachn subarachnoid hemorrhage. Are we good on that? What's up? If it was a traumatic brain injury? Oh, yeah, there would be, be a history of, like, the patient got in a car accident or, like, an injury. Maybe they're, like, a boxer or something like that and got serious, like, TBI. Yeah, I would definitely bring that up. <laughs> yeah, not according to her HPI. Let's see. Just the worst headache in the life and the nausea and vomiting. Just think ruptured berry aneurysm. Those are the key words right there. But we're going to talk about TBIs in neuro.
All right, so this patient's history is completely consistent with giant cell arteritis, which is also referred to as uh, temporal arteritis, right? So temporal artery, if that get, gets affected, you're going to see effects on the vision, right? The eyes, you're going to see like things like headache. Um, this person, you can actually even see the enlarged artery along his forehead, right? Associated with the temporal artery. Um, if you were to put the bell over the artery, you might be able to hear a bruit through that vessel because of, you know, narrowing, it's going to have uh, turbulence and disruption of laminar flow. So this would be giant cell arteritis. Okay. Uh, thromboangitis obliterans, what's the other name for that? We have Weger's disease. Some people pronounce Berger's disease, but then there's also Berger's uh, nephropathy, which is IgA nephropathy. So it's kind of hard to distinguish between those two. But Weger's disease is French. So, so uh, definitely not thrombophobitis. You would see thrombophobitis mostly like in the lower extremities for, for patients like that. Infectious endocarditis, this does not fit the bill for infectious endocarditis at all. All right, let's do two more, and then we'll go into neuro. Oh, wow. So <clears throat> the blood pressure thing is one of the key giveaways that this is involving the aorta. So with an aortic dissection, you're going to get blood starting to pull, right? So what happens, you have like separation of the layers of the tunica intima, tunica media, and that's what causes the dissection. So the aorta ruptures apart, and you have blood kind of pulling into that area. And some people can survive a little bit before they get treated, but a lot of people just die right away if they get a more severe type of dissection. And so with that blood pulling up in the aorta, you're going to see increased blood pressure. Because think about how the aortic arch works, right? You got the brachycephalic, you got also the left subclavian. Those are going to go to the arms, right? So if you take the pulse of that patient, or sorry, the pressure of that patient, the pressure in the upper extremity, because the backflow of blood through those other major vessels coming off the aortic arch, the pressure is going to be higher in your upper extremity. If you take the pulse below, or the pressure below, sorry, then you're going to notice that the pressure is way lower. Because you're not getting enough blood going down to uh, the distal portion of the aorta. And then, so that's one thing, the change in pulse. And then just the description of, uh, I know that the, the description sounds very similar to an acute MI. That's probably why most of you guys chose MI. So he has diaphoresis, shortness of breath, he also has that severe chest pain that radiates to the back. But the pulse pressure is going to be one of the biggest things that helps to distinguish between MI versus aortic dissection. What's up? Yeah, so there's different types of uh, aortic dissections. There's ones that are going to be, it's like distal to the subclavian vein, and that's a type 2, type B, rather. The type A is going to be involving the ascending aorta. So there's t different types of there's different types of aortic dissections, and they would present differently depending on which areas. And then one of those two is the more deadly one. So I can't remember which one it is, but yeah. Any questions? What's up? Yeah, yeah. It depends on the level. If it's like closer to the abdomen, right? You would see depending on where the actual uh, injury is, right? 
for this patient because it seems to be like kind of closer to the aortic arch. So it, it, would, it would look a lot like a heart attack in terms of the, how you would present. Then what would you do for this patient? Uh, you want to rule out heart attack. You do EKG, check out their cardiac uh, markers like troponins, CK, MB, all that. For aortic dissection, you're not going to see those, right? Because it's not involving myocardial ischemia or uh, infarct, right? It's not killing the cardiac cells. So you wouldn't see proponents. You wouldn't see CKMB. So you want to take that patient straight away to the operating room so that you can try to put a stent or a balloon stent in there so that you can open that vessel back up and stabilize it. It's like a stabbing, like a sharp stabbing pain. Versus a heart attack, it's a pressure burning pain. Yeah, PE... He, they all kind of seem similar. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know if it's on inspiration or expiration. Let's think about the logic behind that. If you're breathing in, you're getting oxygen into your... So when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up, right? So when you breathe in because of... Uh, what was that called? It's an arrhythmia, but it's actually normal. Uh, no, is it sinus arrhythmia? I can't remember exactly what it's called. But when you breathe in, when you inspire, when you breathe in, more blood is going to come to your heart. So I would imagine that breathing in would cause more uh, pain because you're trying to increase the demand. And so, yeah, you'll probably see like an increase in pain on inspiration. So I don't know definitively. You might want to look that up. That's way beyond the scope of this class, man. <laughs> Good question, though. You're making me think. You're making me think too hard. I'm trying to make you guys think, right? So uh, this is not an MI. It's not a pulmonary embolism. And uh, definitely not angina, right? So aortic dissection. What kind of uh, shape would you see on these vessels, on the angiography? Yeah, so you'd see corkscrew, corkscrew vessels for this patient. And the big key uh, takeaway here is smoking, right? So it's super clear in the vignette that that's going to be associated with this patient's presentation, right? So smoking is going to cause Boisier's disease. Um, Raynaud's, you know, it's... You can see this happening with Raynaud's, right? You're going to see a transient ischemia with Raynaud's disease. But I really want to associate this kind of clinical vignette with a patient smoking, nicotine products. I want you to associate that with Boisier's disease. If I were to put something like Raynaud's, I would, I would probably say, oh, this patient has a past medical history of like lupus or maybe a past medical history of Sjogren's disease, like something autoimmune so that it would, it would give you like more of a hint that that was like just Raynaud's phenomenon. All right, I'm not going to do the rest of these questions. Do the, uh, the, the remaining 15 on your own. So let's switch gears now and talk about neurology.